Businesses and organizations proudly support SDPB, including the Bush Foundation, investing in great ideas and the people who power them in Minnesota, North Dakota, and South Dakota. BushFoundation.org. Horton Incorporated, engineering environmentally sound airflow solutions designed to save fuel and reduce noise in trucks, off-highway, and industrial equipment for over 65 years. HortonWW.com. You're watching a production of South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Support for Images of the Past is provided by SDN Communications. South Dakota artist Harvey Dunn's 1943 oil on canvas painting Something for Supper shows a man striding forward in a sea of grass with a gun in one hand and wild game in the other. In the background, a team of oxen pulls a wagon. Maybe the person at the reins is the hunter's wife. Maybe there are children. It's a picture of the American dream, born in the colonial era, brought west, and made vivid. Powder muskets and rifles crack and pop during a shooting match at the 40th annual Fort Sisseton Historical Festival in northeastern South Dakota. Right face, twos up. Get up there, twos. Forward, march. Historical reenactors dressed as Union soldiers in the 1860s march in formation. The cavalry fires from horseback. The infantry fires blank rounds from ranks. An artillery unit demonstrates a Gatling gun capable of delivering 40 rounds in four seconds. This historical role playing isn't random. The reenactors know who they are and who they would have been at Fort Sisseton during its operational years. There's something being communicated here about the identity of frontier and settlement era South Dakotans. If how you lived was who you were, guns were a part of your identity. Well, I think it was one of the most important tools that a pioneer had, whether they were uh, gold seekers or farmers or ranchers or whatever it was, there was so much danger in the West. Uh, this part of the country still had grizzly bears, and so then there was a need for protection. The acquisition of food, there were no grocery stores or super values out here. You never knew what was going to happen uh, when the wolf would be at the door or you needed a little more meat on the table. If you think of even the Laura Wilder books, uh, Pa had his gun. I'm sure every household had one, if not more, uh, firearms. It was a necessary part of uh, everyday life. We really do hold on to the gun because I think of what it symbolizes. Uh, independence, uh, it symbolizes overcoming adversity. There's the man versus nature aspect of a gun. Um, all that is sort of encapsulated in this tiny little thing, really. Um, so there's a lot of meaning in a gun. The firearm, which was a very different kind of machine in the day, uh, you know, they weren't rapid fire devices. The firearm was the, the perfect technological extension of all those social dynamics of, of protection and, and hunting and service to the country. Do those circumstances still apply? Does the firearm extend us in the way that it used to? And we, we talk as if it's the same situation. And I would argue that no, it's not. Now you can argue whether they were good or bad, but they certainly were crucial in our history here. And I believe people hang on to them and keep them because they want to keep those stories. Contemporary mores and attitudes are not the same everywhere in America. That may be particularly true when it comes to the way people think about guns. But Americans, like it or not, share a heritage of arms. There are connections between particular firearms, the people who owned or carried them, and the circumstances of the times in which they lived. 
like the story attached to this old French musket donated to a Sioux Falls museum by South Dakota's first U.S. Senator. Richard F. Pettigrew was among the first settlers in Dakota Territory. As a surveyor, he laid out much of what would become Sioux Falls and the counties of eastern South Dakota. He was also a lawyer who represented Dakota Territory in the U.S. Congress. Pettigrew became South Dakota's first U.S. Senator after statehood in 1889. Pettigrew's connection to the musket, in a way, connects South Dakota to the very foundation of the United States. And it actually was carried by his great-grandfather, L. Nathan Sawtell, uh, at the Battle of Bunker Hill, uh, Breed's Hill, in 1775. El Nathan Sawtell served with the Massachusetts militia through the British evacuation of Boston. He rejoined the militia in 1778 for a total of 10 months service during the Revolutionary War. The musket is a model 1746. It was made in an armory in Charleville, France in the 1740s, so it was already around 30 years old when Sawtell carried it at Bunker Hill. Interestingly, he got the musket when during the French and Indian Wars, the Massachusetts militia helped take a French fortress of Louisbourg uh, in Canada and uh, was able to arm themselves with these great French muskets. It's 69 caliber, uh, a flint lock. Um, the, the hammer held a piece of stone, of flint, and you had a pan. Uh, you put powder in the pan, closed the top, and then when you pulled the trigger, the hammer came and the flint scraped on the steel, creating a spark that touched off the powder and fired the weapon. Forty years after the American Revolution, the flintlock was still the best technology available to the mountain men and fur trappers operating in what would eventually be South Dakota. The 2015 movie The Revenant tells the story of Hugh Glass, who was mauled by a bear and left for dead. Glass crawled and rafted his way over 200 miles of prairie and river to reach Fort Kiowa, near the site of present-day Chamberlain. Early American flintlocks had some disadvantages, but, says firearms expert Larry Bradley, the craftsmanship it took to make them is still something to be respected. An individual craftsman would harvest the wood and shape the stock. Often they would uh, uh, spiral uh, iron into the barrel. They would make their tools often out of old discarded files and so on. So uh, some, of these, some of these guns were made by an individual craftsman who did every part of it. Respect for the gunsmith's craft is part of a well-made gun's appeal as an object. The collection at the W.H. Over Museum spans centuries, from old Chinese and Japanese matchlocks to Vietnam-era hardware. Museum founder William Henry Over contributed his own collection, but many more of the guns in the state's oldest museum were donated by other collectors. Some of the guns come with personal stories, some don't. They caught someone's eye and were collected for that reason alone. But even without verified provenance, every style of gun reflects the intentions of the people who owned them. There were no restrictions. It was every person for themselves, including women. And the women often had this cylinder of fur called a muff. You could put your hands in it, keep your hands warm. It was also a style thing, I think. And as a consequence, there were pistols small enough to put inside the muff. So you had these muff pistols that could be used uh, by women for protection. Firearms technology changed significantly in the mid-19th century. Standardized parts meant that the guns could be manufactured in large numbers and they could be more easily repaired. The flintlock was eclipsed by a more reliable percussion system. You know, when percussion caps came out, they were so much better. They were actually invented by a Scotsman who got tired of um, not being able to go hunting because the, of the damp weather over there. You get water in your frozen of your flintlock and you're done. Unlike the flintlock, what you would do with a with percussion rifle is rather than priming the pan, you would put the, put the rifle on half cock, and this one is pretty bad. It, it would go off half cocked. But 
you would you can see the nipple the nipple uh, sticking up on the on the drum here and you'd put the cap on that you'd go into full cock and when you released it the hammer it has a little depression in it it would come down on the cap the cap would explode much as the same way the powder in the pan uh, would flash it went into the barrel through this drum and would ignite the charge so it was much more uh, it was a quick action cartridge ammunition breech loading rifles and repeating rifles like the henry were being perfected by 1860 the advantage to this one is you have a very large magazine holds 13 rounds loads from the front and it's very easy to work Drop in 13 rounds, swing it back. The follower will push the ammunition back to the action. Activated by moving the lever down, which brings the cartridge up. So that when you return the lever forward, chambers it, automatically cocks the hammer. Very high rate of fire. But repeating rifles were expensive. The rank and file at the start of the Civil War carried what the government provided. This 1861 Springfield rifle, now in the care of the South Dakota State Historical Society, is one of tens of thousands issued to Union troops. It has a unique South Dakota connection. Leopold Joseph Balza was my great-great-grandfather, and he had brought this out with him after the Civil War. They came to near Cavour on a farm that he lived on until his death in 1914. And uh, this, is, this, is, uh, uh, this was his, he carried it during the Civil War. He brought it with him and it stayed within the family. What we've found from history and from letters and information being passed down from family members is that uh, he enlisted uh, in uh, Company G of the, uh, the 18th Wisconsin uh, Infantry. We know that he uh, saw uh, combat, and uh, we know that he was injured during the Civil War. He lost a, a toe. Leopold Balza was born in Belgium and immigrated to Door County, Wisconsin. He entered service with the 18th Wisconsin Infantry on October 4, 1864, and was present at the Battle of Alatoona, Georgia on October 5th. The Union garrison there had been ordered to protect a supply line to Atlanta, which had fallen to General Sherman the past summer. The Union counted more than 700 casualties in the battle, the Confederates almost 900. It's known that Leopold Balza's regiment was attached to the Union's Army of the Tennessee, which left the Atlanta area on November 15, 1864, bound for Savannah. The Union's Army of Georgia made up the second prong of the march, approaching Savannah from the northwest. After taking Savannah, William Tecumseh Sherman's troops marched north through the Carolinas. Leopold Balza was present at the Battle of Wise Fork near Kinston, North Carolina, in a three-day battle lasting from March 7th through March 10th, 1865. Union troops defeated an entrenched Confederate force, hoping to slow their advance. The end of the war was only about eight weeks away. Leopold Balza's 18th Wisconsin Infantry marched in parades through the streets of Washington, D.C. during the Grand Review celebrations on May 23rd and 24th of 1865. Balza returned home to Brussels, Wisconsin, got married and resumed farming. In 1885, he left Wisconsin with his wife and two daughters for a farm near Cavour, South Dakota. He brought his Springfield rifle with him. For the Balza family and uh, those members of that family that stayed on that farm, they kept it in trust. They kept it there. They kept it in good condition. It, uh, it uh, did not come out uh, at all during the... Uh, uh, it was never used again to the best of our knowledge, and so it was kept in pretty pristine condition. Mike Rounds credits a number of family members for its good condition and donation to the South Dakota State Cultural Heritage Center. In particular, his second cousin, Leon Bay. Who took the time to not only protect it all of these years, as he stayed on the farm that uh, Leopold had originally been on, and then he showed it to family members on a regular basis, 
but he always made sure to protect it. And he understood the significance of this to the entire family, and he wanted it here in South Dakota. So I give him a huge amount of credit for actually taking the initiative. Uh, he passed away while I was still governor, but uh, he wanted to make sure that it was here and available and that it was an important part of South Dakota history to connect us with the Civil War as well. And that's a message that we want the next generation to learn as well, that, that we had family members who were actively engaged in important aspects of our nation's history and that it isn't something that's disconnected. Another Civil War firearm, this one in the care of the old Courthouse Museum in Sioux Falls, offers another connection to the Civil War and a surprising coincidence. This one is a, a Prussian model 1809 musket originally made as a flintlock. And when the Civil War broke out, um, both North and South agents went to Europe and really cleaned out a lot of their arsenals. Uh, buying up old obsolete arms and converting them to a percussion cap. It was carried by Joseph M. Dixon when he served in the Civil War in Company F of the 125th Illinois Volunteer Infantry. And Dixon fought uh, throughout the Civil War in the Western Theater of Operations with the Army of the Tennessee. So he was, at, uh, he was at Shiloh and Vicksburg and the Chattanooga campaign and the battles for Atlanta. And, and this happens to be a musket that uh, he carried during the war. J.M. Dixon entered into service with the 125th Illinois Infantry on October 7, 1862. He was captured in Kentucky on December 29th of that year by a group of rogue Confederates under the command of General John Hunt Morgan. Against orders, Morgan's Raiders, as they were known, engaged in a series of strikes on a path through Kentucky and into Ohio, where Union troops finally put a stop to it. The Raiders were known for capturing Union troops and paroling them shortly thereafter. J.M. Dixon was released about four months after being captured. It's known that Dixon was wounded during the Chattanooga campaign. He was also wounded in an accident at Shepherd's Run, Tennessee. Corporal Dixon was disciplined for being absent without leave for about two weeks during the summer of 1863, demoted in what the Army used to call reduced to the ranks. He had to give up 13 days' pay. Dixon's regiment also participated in Sherman's march to the sea. Muster roll cards show that Dixon was present with the regiment during the corresponding dates. The 125th Illinois also participated in the Carolinas campaign, and at the war's end, they marched in the Grand Review. After the war, Dixon took up farming in Illinois, but in 1871, he moved to a farm in Minnehaha County, north of Sioux Falls. He gave up farming in 1879 when he was elected Minnehaha County Sheriff, a job he held for six years. He was then hired as the chief of police in Sioux Falls and served for three years in that post. At some point, he also owned a concrete company that poured city sidewalks. Joseph Dixon died in 1917. His name had appeared often in the pages of the Sioux Falls Argus Leader, but there are no photos on file. He may have left a photo of himself to a family member, but a public appeal from the Fraternal Order of Police in 1946 came up empty. J.M. Dixon's musket and Leopold Balls's Springfield are now stored in museums about 250 miles apart, and there's probably no way of knowing whether Dixon and Balls were ever closer than that during the war. All that can be said for sure is that in the end, they were both South Dakotans. <laughs> Sioux Falls and Eastern Dakota Territory filled in quickly during and after the 1860s. In the West, after news reports that George Armstrong Custer's 1874 expedition to the Black Hills had found gold, an invasion by miners and other fortune hunters was probably inevitable. The Gordon Party arrived in the Black Hills in December of 1874. They erected a stockade on French Creek near present-day Custer. The Army removed them in 1875, but it's believed that most, if not all, of them returned. 
more gold was found in the Deadwood area in 1875 and 1876. The army gave up trying to hold back the large number of people coming into the Black Hills. The army did not give up trying to keep regional Indian tribes on their respective reservations. In 1876, the military launched an offensive on tribes in Montana, Wyoming, and Dakota Territory. General George Armstrong Custer's Battalion of the 7th Cavalry was dispatched from Fort Abraham Lincoln. The Battle of the Little Bighorn, known on the native side as the Battle of the Greasy Grass, has been studied by historians and analyzed by forensic scientists surveying the site inch by inch. Relic firearms from the fight range in condition from this rusted portion of a rifle to this very well-preserved rifle. Retired contractor Wendell Grandguard has been collecting guns since he was a teenager. He's particularly interested in guns from the Custer battlefield and owns a number of them. This is, a, uh, is an 1874 Winch, or Sharps 4570 and was owned by White Cow Bull. And White Cow Bull was a, uh, a uh, Ogallala. When the troops, uh, two companies of, uh, of, of uh, George Armstrong Custer working across the river and come into the camp, he, uh, of course, his rifle was loaded. And so he stepped out from behind the bushes and just at about the time that Custer was halfway across the river, he took this 4570 Sharps and he uh, uh, hit uh, Custer right in the shoulder, flipped him right off of his horse into the water. That changed the whole dynamics of the battle with this rifle. So they turned then and went back up uh, to the location where we, uh, later was the last stand hill. Grand Guard's interest in the Little Bighorn guns is so strong, he's written a book filled with detail about each and every one of the guns believed to have been there. Connecting a particular firearm to a particular soldier isn't simple, but serial numbers can be matched to Army records. It's a different story with guns owned by Indians. But Grand Guard says he can connect particular guns to their native owners. He enjoyed a long friendship with Ben Black Elk, the son of Little Bighorn veteran Black Elk. Ben Black Elk introduced him to a lot of people on the reservation, so he saw and heard the stories of guns passed down to relatives. Grand Guards also made a study of the embedded buttons and other markings typical on native-owned guns. The buttons and marks indicate ownership, tribal affiliation, and other information. All of the markings have meaning. They all tell a story if you know how to read them. Sometimes there's the history of who he killed and where it was used and so on. This gun was carried on the native side in several important battles, including the battle at the Little Bighorn. This revolver belonged to a member of the 7th Cavalry. It was retrieved from a saddlebag left on the battlefield. The soldier never had a chance to use it. They kept them loaded and carried them in their, their uh, saddlebags so that they could uh, have a backup gun. And if, if they got into a situation where they needed to do a lot of shoot, shooting, they would have a revolver in each hand and have 12 shots. Grand Guard's collection also includes a rifle whose ownership can be traced to Crazy Horse. It's currently in storage in Mitchell, where Grand Guard hopes to open a museum. Whatever else he did or did not do during his lifetime, George Armstrong Custer liked hunting and he owned a number of guns. This Sharps Hawken was one of his hunting rifles. It was presented to the city of Custer, South Dakota many years after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And it is a, a 52 caliber rifle. Uh, it is what they call a breech load. You can open it up and that's where the shell goes in uh, and close it again. Uh, cock it to fire. Um, it was a, a fairly substantial hunting rifle at the time. It was one of his favorite hunting rifles. He had several, by the way. But this particular one was still in the possession of his wife after he was killed at Little Bighorn. What happened was that in 1928, the city of Custer invited Libby Custer, who was then living in New York City, was 78 years old, and they invited her to come to Custer and uh, experience the 
uh, Gold Discovery Days and ask her to uh, come as an honored guest. She couldn't make that long trip from New York to South Dakota, and so she did the next best thing. She took this rifle from her collection and sent it to the city of Custer. And since then, it has been displayed in our museums and including the museum here at the 1881 Courthouse. It's a, a rare opportunity to, to have in your hands something that you know that one of the great history makers of America, no matter what your opinion is of General Custer, this belonged to him and he used this gun it, during his lifetime, and it does have a significance, there's no question about it. Custer's end at the Little Bighorn in June of 1876 was among several historic happenings that year. On August 2nd, Wild Bill Hickok was shot to death in a Deadwood saloon. Already famous, Hitchcock's legend only grew after his death. So did interest in his gun. Wild Bill's gun was an 1860 Army Colt revolver, uh, 44 caliber. Uh, you know, there were a lot of those in the day, uh, Colt made a lot of money by contracts with the Navy and the Army. The expert on Wild Bill, a guy named Joseph Rosa, an English gentleman, he did his homework and he is the acknowledged authority. He didn't think that Wild Bill ever had such a gun. However, uh, a man who came to Deadwood with Wild Bill said, yeah, he had this kind of gun. It could well be his. So that's an indication that Wild Bill would have kept up with the technology that was available. You know, as a gun guy, he would have bought what he could afford, the newest and the best. So it's interesting to go into the situation of these people's lives and imagine the role that it played in their daily dealings with people. He, he's just a very convenient example of, of the story in that here he comes to Deadwood, which was a wild and crazy place at the time. He was shot in the back of the head by, uh, by a guy who personified evil in that he was a coward. Well, what a way to go, you know, better than being in a nursing home and slowly losing your sight and not knowing how, where your guns are. So he, he did it in a way that suits the legend perfectly. It seems that just being close to Wild Bill Hickok could make you famous. Hickok's traveling companion, Charlie Utter's pistol, is also considered museum worthy. Then there's Martha Jane Canary, a.k.a. Calamity Jane. She came to the Black Hills in 1875 and was settled in Deadwood in 1876. She was an unusual woman for her time in many ways. Whether she had an affinity for firearms or simply viewed them as the tools of her trade as a scout, it's known that she had a number of them. Like this 1873 Winchester, it was purchased by a Sioux Falls collector and now resides in storage at the old courthouse museum. Calamity Jane traveled and lived in Montana before returning to Deadwood, where she died in 1903. A gun belonging to one of the more reputable characters in Black Hills history is also on display in Deadwood. Among other occupations, Seth Bullock was a businessman, a cattle baron, and a lawman. It's said that Bullock preferred to and could talk a confrontation through to an amicable end, but it was understood that he'd consider alternatives. This high-powered rifle has close connections to a major event in American history and to the founding of Rapid City. This is a Sharps uh, 7090. It is a Buffalo gun owned by Tom Ferguson. Tom Ferguson was one of the original founders of Rapid City. He used it in his trade, he was providing meat for, among other things, crews for the railroad, uh, railroad construction crews, um, forts, trappers, traders, miners. So it was uh, a working tool for him. People that just hunted for themselves would have got a much uh, a less expensive gun. Yes, it would have been a significant amount of money, the $250 to $300, which in the day was a large amount of money. I mean, it would be, a, an, an analogy would be a piece of heavy equipment today that is purchased by a construction company. And no other gun of the day was as effective as the Sharps. And in fact, when they were introduced, you start hearing about men standing on hills and killing literally hundreds of buffalo in one sitting with this gun. Um, it became almost like a factory. Uh, you could call it a buffalo killing factory. Well, the gun was brought here by uh, Thomas Ferguson when he was uh, of the, uh, in the original party that settled Rapid City. He'd come to the Black Hills in 1875 originally um, because of the gold rush 
and he was kicked out immediately. Uh, the government troops uh, 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 escorted the miners as they were able to find them and get them out. But like most of the miners, he came back. And a group of the men got together and decided they were pretty much mining was not for them. They were not making any money. And they got the idea that we need to go settle a town. And uh, the quote that's often quoted is, mine the miners. So he joined this group of men. They came down into Rapid Valley, and they founded Rapid City. And that was in uh, February of 1876. Certain guns from the 1880s were so popular and carried by so many people that they became symbols of the period. This is a Colt Peacemaker, the uh, Colt Single Action Army. Uh, they normally carried these pistols with one chamber empty because the, uh, if it, this had a fixed firing pin and if you dropped it and it landed on the hammer, it would go off. So almost all cowboys uh, of that period carried it with, on a, with the hammer down on an empty chamber. This shotgun here is uh, a Parker 12-gauge side-by-side shotgun. This particular gun has shorter bales and it kind of represents uh, what they call a coach gun. Wells Fargo ordered quite a few of these shotguns uh, when uh, they were running their stage line and uh, freighting business. Guns have often been used as currency. This shotgun sealed a land deal that changed South Dakota history. One of the more interesting guns in our collection is this W.C. Scott shotgun. Um, it was, the story behind it is that it was traded to the, a man named Joseph Curley, who was a squatter in the Pier area. He, he actually ran a ferry service, and uh, a party approached him to sell the land for $1,500 and the shotgun, and uh, Curley accepted. And it turned out it was, uh, they were working on behalf of the Chicago Northwestern Railroad, who plotted Pier, and uh, Curley could have made a small fortune off of selling land rights to the to the railroad, uh, to what became the capital city. Buffalo Bill Cody's famed Wild West show came to South Dakota on several occasions between 1883 and 1912. The show featured a lot of gunfire. Trick shots like Annie Oakley thrilled the crowds. Cody was well known for giving guns as gifts. He presented this Winchester rifle to a Deadwood businessman as a sign of friendship. Buffalo Bill star and the appeal of the show faded over time. Cody and his show had visited Sioux Falls on several occasions, but he was probably near the sunset of his career when he presented this Winchester to a Sioux Falls bar owner to settle a tab. Whatever frontier romance that the newspapers and dime novels of the 1880s and 90s had been able to attach to the wild days of Dakota, ended on December 29, 1890 at a Lakota camp on Wounded Knee Creek on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Guns were at the center of the dispute. It's known that U.S. troops were disarming the Lakota. They intended to gather up guns that could be used against them, and whether or not those same guns could also be used to hunt wild game to feed a family. A fight broke out when one of the Lakota refused to give up his rifle and the gun went off. Several Lakota then opened fire on the cavalry who started shooting back, first with small arms, then with artillery trained on the camp. When it was all over, 25 soldiers and from 150 to 300 Lakota were dead, the bloodiest day in South Dakota history. Relics from the massacre are on display at the State Historical Society Museum in Pierre. A week after the massacre, a 22-year-old Sikangu Lakota named Plenty Horses shot an army lieutenant with this rifle. Plenty Horses was arrested and the rifle was seized as evidence in what would be a landmark trial. Plenty Horses uh, was in a group of Sioux who ran into Lieutenant Edward Casey of the United States Indian Scouts, who was uh, escorted by a group of Cheyenne Scouts. Uh, at the time, um, Casey conversed with these different groups of Indians and they warned him that uh, he shouldn't approach the hostile camp any closer. Casey turned to go and was shot uh, by Plenty Horses. Plenty Horses was 
arrested and, and eventually tried for murder. Plenty of Horses was found innocent of uh, murder in, in a court trial, in a directed verdict. Um, uh, because a state of war existed between the Sioux Nation and the United States Army at the time. So they considered it an act of war, not an act of murder. When war broke out between Spain and the United States in 1898, nearly a thousand South Dakotans enlisted to join the fight. Seth Bullock and a cadre of South Dakota cowboys fought in Cuba with Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Troops of the South Dakota 1st Volunteer Infantry joined the fighting in the Philippines. When the conflict ended in 1899, some returning soldiers brought their rifles home. Some of the guns ended up in museums. You know, just like in any war, uh, there were souvenir hunters um, in, in, on the battlefield and then also elsewhere, and the South Dakota boys were no exception. They seemed to take down everything that was uh, that was and wasn't nailed down, so half of the Philippines seemed to be coming back with them, including this rifle. Uh, this South Dakota State Historical Society does have quite the collection of Spanish-American War-related uh, materials because we were founded in 1901, shortly after those, uh, those conflicts were ending and all these soldiers were returning to the United States with, with these items. Some of the same South Dakota troops who had served in the Spanish-American War were among those sent to protect the Texas-Mexico border during the Mexican Revolution in 1916. They didn't see combat, but the Army used the opportunity to train the troops for potential involvement in World War I. When the United States entered World War I in 1917, some 32,000 South Dakotans enlisted or were drafted. Some were veterans of the two earlier conflicts. South Dakota's 147th Field Artillery in particular saw intense combat in France and Belgium. More than 200 South Dakotans would die in combat, an unknown number more died in the 1918 flu pandemic. At home, men too old or unfit to join the regular army joined what was called the Home Guard. They were armed with what was available. One Home Guard member carried this Remington rolling block rifle. It was a respectable firearm in its day, but its design dated to the Civil War. When the Great War ended in 1918 and the troops came home, some returned with a remarkable amount and variety of battlefield weapons. So right now we're bringing down a World War I German anti-tank gun. Uh, a gigantic Mauser rifle. It is a monster gun. Uh, it's not as heavy. Guns, and especially handguns, have always been on one side of the law or the other. The revolver on the right belonged to a notorious livestock thief named William Buff George. George was held in the Fort Pier jail on more than one occasion. He died in 1959, it's unlikely but possible that he may have been acquainted with the owner of the revolver on the left. It belonged to Harvey Fackelman, who served as the chief of police in Fort Pier from 1948 through 1965. It's not known if Fackelman ever used the weapon in the line of duty, but a clipping from the Sioux Falls Argus leader suggests there's a pretty good chance that he did. Prohibition came to South Dakota early when Governor Peter Norbeck signed what was known as the Bone Dry Law in 1917. Prohibition didn't work any better in South Dakota than it did in the rest of the country during the National Prohibition of 1920 through 1933. Law enforcement officers conducted raids all over South Dakota, destroying stills and seizing bootlegger weapons. This bespeaks the uh, Prohibition era in Deadwood. This was taken on a raid by uh, Sheriff Whitey Helmer in the uh, 20, early 20s. And so somebody had this illegally, for what purpose, who knows? Gun violence during the Prohibition years prompted the National Firearms Act of 1934. That and a landmark Supreme Court decision made it illegal to own automatic weapons and certain types of modified rifles and shotguns. The law still applies even to museums. And you could wonder, well, why is a gun like this still a threat? Because you can buy much smaller, more lethal guns now, but that's what the law says. 
Congress and state legislatures had banned certain types of guns before the 1934 Act, a series of laws restricting so-called market hunting outlawed the use of huge boat-mounted shotguns known as punt guns. It was, it was big bore. It loaded up with a pound of shot. It mounted on the punt of a boat. The story was you shot it in the morning and you picked up game all afternoon. The 1930s also saw the first and only killing of a South Dakota State Penitentiary Warden. Eugene Riley of Sioux Falls, and Eugene was born in Iowa and moved to Sioux Falls in 1909 to become a deputy sheriff of Minnehaha County. In 1933, he was appointed warden of the South Dakota State Penitentiary here in Sioux Falls. This was his personal firearm. It happened in March of 1936 when inmates armed with two revolvers that had been smuggled into the prison kidnapped 72-year-old Eugene Riley and attempted a getaway in a stolen car. Guards caught up to them and the shooting started. Riley, two inmates, and a passerby were killed. A deputy and another inmate were wounded. Warden Riley had a gun as part of his job but never used it. Some 65,000 South Dakotans entered service during World War II. Lloyd Brandt was born in Hamill, South Dakota, north of Winter, in 1926. He and five of his six brothers, including his twin brother Lester, all served in the Marine Corps. Brandt's wartime service in the Pacific is amazing in its length and breadth. He entered the war in the Marshall Islands campaign, then came Saipan, Tinian, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Brant's job with an amphibious recon unit was similar to the job done today by Navy SEALs. Our, our primary mission was to secure the island if we could and uh, gather information for the assault troops for later on. And if we ran across an island where there was a few Japanese that we thought we could capture, the, uh, where we could capture the island, we would do that. And we did that several times, but uh, I guess you'd call us special forces. Uh, they didn't call us that back then, but that's what we were. Like many other soldiers, sailors, and Marines, Brandt carried different weapons at different times. He says he never felt much of anything about guns one way or the other. We were too poor to have a firearm at that time. This was in the start of the de Depression. so. Uh, we, we had no experiences with firearms as, as children. The only, the only t experience we had was later on when we were in the Marine Corps and fought in World War II. Some of Lloyd Brandt's memories are very tough. His older brother Herbert died on Saipan. His twin brother Lester was critically wounded by sniper fire on Okinawa. We, we had rainy season on Okinawa, the, the, a lot of rain, and the mud was probably up to your ankles at that time. And uh, when he was wounded, the only thing that saved his life was he fell on the side where he was wounded, and the mud plugged up his arteries so that he didn't bleed to death. And he laid there for several minutes, and uh, the rest of his platoon bypassed him, thought he was dead because he wasn't moving. And finally, one of the corpsmen from another platoon saw him move, and he came over and uh, got him a stretcher on a jeep and put him, uh, put him on that and sent him back to the battalion aid station where they could take care of him preliminary, you know. He lived till he was uh, 90 years old. He passed away last no November. After the war, Lloyd Brandt worked as a lineman and electrician. He retired as the chief electrician for the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City. Lloyd and Joyce have been married for 70 years. Rapid City resident Bill Lofgren grew up in Minneapolis. He knew that he would likely be drafted right out of high school, so he enlisted. At basic training in California, Lofgren earned certification in the standard issue rifle for thousands of American GIs, the M1. Lofgren grew up in a hunting family and always liked guns. My dad was a hunter, and uh, so I grew up around uh, hunting, and 
when I came home from World War II as a welcome home present, my dad gave me a gun. And uh, my mother said, oh, after three years of chasing around with a gun and being shot at, you're going to give him a gun when he comes home, but it could have been the more appropriate. As, uh, my hobbies were guns, and uh, I shot skeet and trap and, and uh, prairie dogs, anything that would shoot, I shot it. So. Bill Lofgren remembers being crowded onto the Queen Mary with thousands of other GIs bound for Europe. He says it was so crowded they had to sleep in shifts. He served with the U.S. First Army. His first engagement was the Battle of the Bulge. We were back in a rest area because they'd taken us active divisions and put us in a rest area because they thought it was a, going to be a calm winter. And uh, they put two uh, battle, uh, two units that weren't, haven't been battle tested uh, in the front lines and the Germans overran them so fast that it made your head swim. And so we were back in rest area and they just jumped over the kitchen and loaded us up on trucks and sent us up there. And uh, it was cold and miserable. And uh, the worst thing was the, our feet. We had the same foot gear that we had in the summertime we had all winter long. And then in the spring when it turned nice, we got, we got uh, winter boots. Lofgren's choice of arms changed as the fighting shifted from rural to urban areas. For the first part of the, uh, my combat, why, it was fairly long range, so I used an M1. And as we get closer to the end of the war, it was more close range uh, combat. And uh, so I, the tank got shot out from under the driver uh, right next to me. and. He had a Tommy gun, so I took his Tommy gun. I don't know what I did with the M1, but uh, during combat, they didn't keep track of your weapons. You just picked up what you wanted, so I carried the Tommy gun for the rest of the war. Bill Lofgren fought his way from west to east across Germany. He then headed south into Czechoslovakia. He was wounded there by shrapnel in a firefight that claimed several comrades. He remembers being lifted onto a stretcher and nothing more until he woke up in a Paris hospital. Lofgren returned to Minneapolis after the war and got into the home building business. He married Jane Quick in 1946. They'd known one another before the war, but not well. The Lofgrens moved to Rapid City for a home building job in 1970 and never left. Bill and Jane celebrated their 70th anniversary in October of 2016. Without question, Joe Foss was the most famous South Dakotan to serve during World War II. He was the Marine Corps' top flying ace. After the war, Joe Foss continued to live an energetic and high-profile life. He served two terms as South Dakota governor, was the first commissioner of the American Football League, and got into television. This 1962 episode of ABC's The American Sportsman features Foss on a sort of celebrity pheasant hunt near Howard. Now we're in a cornfield about a mile outside of Howard, South Dakota. And in just about seven or eight minutes, a big day in this state every year, the opening of the pheasant season. There are 50,000 out-of-state hunters who have come to South Dakota for this pheasant season, and we've invited four of the out of the, three out-of-state men and one in-state hunter to come here on this pheasant hunting party with us. Our host today, a man of many titles, General, Governor, Commissioner. Former Governor of South Dakota, Joe Foss, one of our great war heroes during World War II, and now the Commissioner of the American Football League. He was uh, born in a farm in South Dakota, has hunted here all his life. And uh, Joe, what about Mr. Pheasant here? You got them all ready for us? Well, there's one thing about it. We have a beautiful day today. I was a little bit afraid that we'd get uh, mudded down the way it's been raining the last couple of days. Wind's kicking up a little. How will that affect the shooting? Well, actually, that makes the bird a little tougher to hit. Uh, and, of course, I'm, that's a good excuse for me to miss right now. Well, Joe, let's get some of your guests in here. Of course, General James Doolittle, who uh, led the bombing attack on Tokyo, one of the epics of American history. And the general's uh, quite a sportsman and shot himself, isn't he, Joe? Well, uh, as far as I'm concerned, he's the best. It, uh, the way he gets around after those mountain sheep, he does better than the mountain goats. 
General, uh, you've come to South Dakota pheasant hunting many times, haven't you? I haven't been here, but I've been up in the north. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to be with you. But don't believe what Joe says about my shooting. I love to mess. Well, you know, uh, Joe, they say uh, South Dakota's wonderful, but there's an old saying. Uh, I was uh, reared in Wyoming right next to Colorado. It is a privilege to live in Colorado. And we have Governor John Love of the state of Colorado. Governor, nice to see you here today. Nice to be here. Listen to this conversation. It sounds like a bunch of golfers on the first tee. Our other guest is uh, Robert Stack, the movie and television star, but also a former national 20-gauge champion, three times on the All-American Skeet Team, holds two world records, and incidentally, during World War II, Bob Stack was a gunnery officer. Uh, he taught transitory machine gun and light artillery. In other words, he tra taught our troops how to hit a moving target. Now, Bob, with your tight schedule of uh, movie and television, uh, you get much chance to pheasant hunt? Well, I haven't shot pheasants in 10 years, actually, and after that buildup, I'm sure I'll miss the first 10. It's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I used to shoot skeet many years ago, and uh, I know that, that Joe and all the rest of these tigers here today have been shooting pheasants. Uh, I wouldn't say they've been practicing. The season hasn't opened yet, but I know they've been practicing every year, and uh, I'm very proud to be included in this group, and I know that we'll have a lot of fun even if we do miss a few. Gentlemen, the birds are ready. The South Dakota pheasant season is ready, and good hunting. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. We'll need it. Okay, troops, fall in. Oh, brother. <laughs> Iron fall back. That's enough of that laughing. Okay, now let's see. You'll all get plenty of shooting. There are plenty of birds out here, and if you happen to go through a field and you don't uh, be in a position where you get a chance to shoot and a bird flies up in front of someone else, let that old boy have it. Don't try and show what an excellent shot you are by wiping some guy's nose off across the line. As we move through the field, Watch the guy on your left and your right and stay in line. Now, if you knock down a bird, watch where the bird drops, but don't try to beat Jesse Owens record getting up there picking it up. Uh, on this deal, we'll have a lot of fun, just a real wonderful time out here, and a lot of laughs. There isn't a crack shot in this outfit that I know of. Uh, no one's proven it yet anyway, and uh, I'll probably be the first one to miss. So with that, uh, we'll get started here. A couple other items. You don't load your gun till you're in the field. Uh, you don't come out of the field with a loaded gun. If you scare one up on the way back to the car, uh, just laugh at him and get him in the next field. Uh, another thing is uh, climbing over a fence. When you come to the fences, hand your gun over to the man that's over the fence without a gun to start with. And don't flatten the fence down because they do have uh, cattle and hogs in these fields and it, it's a little tough to... Uh, uh, build them back up after the thundering herd goes over. So watch the fences. Uh, no low shooting. No shooting of birds on the ground. Uh, if you knock down a bird and it's a crip, if you can't grab the baby, let him uh, get away rather than uh, uh, blast on the ground. You have anything to add? Covered or all? Let yes, sir. And have your guns up uh, in the air and your safety on as you go through the field. Uh, and then you. Press the old safety off and let her go. Rooster! Rooster. Nice shot, oh, a fine shot by Bob Stack. On the north end, you're a little too far ahead. Joe Foss was president of the National Rifle Association from 1988 until 1990. He was a strong advocate for gun ownership without many restrictions. Foss died in 2003 at the age of 88. In South Dakota's heritage of arms, there's a slow rolling and soft boundary between what can be considered heritage and what's still part of contemporary life, those things that have evolved but persist. Pheasant hunting has been a part of South Dakota culture since the birds were introduced in 1908. A few things have changed, but there's no hard boundary between the way things were then and the way things are today. Guns are tools, and they are tools that have been important for not just the settling of this state, and uh, farmers coming out here, ranchers coming out here, they use guns as tools. They were protection, they were also used for recreation, they were used for gathering food. And so the gun itself can be a number of different types of tools rolled into one. Uh, what I like is the fact that today, the vast majority of us use guns as a tool 
in a responsible way for recreational opportunities and something that is a part of our culture. But in the case of firearms generally, the technological innovations made during the Vietnam War did change things. American soldiers armed with M16 and other automatic rifles faced an enemy armed with Russian or Chinese made rifles like this one, captured by a South Dakota soldier fighting on the outskirts of Hue City in 1968. Today, there are millions of rifles like these all over the world. Semi-automatic variants are available for purchase by American civilians under certain conditions. Some call them modern sporting arms, others call them assault weapons. They have been and continue to be used as both. The boundary between heritage and contemporary times also shifts at watershed events, when something that used to be is no longer. The 1963 assassination of John F. Kennedy is one such event. Some historians have called it America's loss of innocence. Americans have different views about the details of the Kennedy assassination, but it's generally accepted that Lee Harvey Oswald shot President Kennedy using a cheap Italian-made carbine like this one. They're pretty rickety, and yet they were readily available. Ten dollars, you could get one. Uh, almost anywhere. They were surplused out and they were not top of the line uh, uh, rifles that you could utilize and you could get, a, actually they threw in uh, I think a half a box of cartridges with that ten dollars that you used to buy it. On Masterpiece. Mrs. Coyne. Rose, please. Men are a deal more likely to do favors for a woman than for a man. Do you want me to flirt? Phyllis! What are you doing? I've got the flag up. I'm not for stopping. <laughs> Jail for our friend. <laughs> 